This episode of Advocates, the podcast, is supported by Taylor's Law School, where you get to learn about law and justice. Explore how these top advocates battle injustice as they tell us their stories. Listen to the voices of the advocates. Welcome to Advocates, the podcast, where you get to listen to the best legal talent from all over the world. Our guest for this episode is Johan Kriegler of South Africa. He has a unique story to tell, one that begins with him as a junior barrister and then a silk in South Africa at the height of apartheid, acting one day for the left and then like a true black cab the next day for far-right individuals such as Eugene Terreblanche. It is a fascinating journey in a time of incredible tumult and one I am sure you will enjoy. I give you Johan Kriegler. We have with us uh, Johan Kriegler, who used to be an advocate in South Africa and was a judge in the Constitutional Court of South Africa. Judge, welcome to our podcast and thank you very much for sparing the time to be here. Let's start with a little bit about your, your childhood and your background and your, and your family. Can you tell us a little, little bit about that? I was born into a military family. My father was a career officer in the South African Defence Force. That was way back in the 30s. A little military town outside Pretoria, the capital of South Africa. The place at that time was called Roberts Heights after Lord Roberts, a famous British commanding officer during the Boer War. Its name subsequently changed and it is today called Aba Tswane, the Hill of Tswane, which is a historical name significant to the local Tswana people. I grew up partly in Pretoria, partly in Britain, partly in Johannesburg. My father, being a career officer, was posted from one place to another. And I went to school in Pretoria in a town, a little town called Heidelberg, southwest of Johannesburg and in Johannesburg. I matriculated, did my school leaving and university admission exam at a well-known Johannesburg school, King Edward VII High School, which is an English high school. I am Afrikaans speaking. I was born into an Afrikaner family. Both my grandfathers fought in the Boer War. Both were wounded, one of them fatally. My father and his mother and siblings were removed to concentration camps during the Boer War. So I grew up with that kind of background. There was a possibility that I would go into law. And so my parents and I decided that because I was Afrikaans speaking, but the language of the law in my country is largely English, I should go to English high school. So I went to King Edwards to go and perfect my English. In the meantime, I also did elocution lessons in order to ensure that my English was adequate. And how did this notion of you taking up law come about? It actually started more as a joke than anything else. My maternal grandmother said on occasion to me, that I'm so clever and I'm always up with an answer and I'm cheeky and evasive enough to get away with any mischief, why don't I become an advocate one day? And this was somehow, there was no legal tradition in the family. We'd, we'd never had any lawyers around. It really wasn't a career choice yet, but it was a, a strong possibility. And it was for that reason that we thought about it. I can't really tell you at what stage my parents decided I should go into law, I could tell you at what stage I thought so, and that was fairly firmly throughout my high school years. My father wanted me to follow in his footsteps. My mother quietly didn't, but eventually I did first start off in the military as a career cadet officer in 1950, I was one of the first experimental course that was going to be sent to university by the army. This was a, a revolutionary thought in the post-war era. The idea was that I would get a degree 
at government expense, it soon proved a failure. Neither I nor the army liked the other, and I got out after 18 months. At that stage, my parents were in the United States. I was an 18-year-old boy, 19 years old, and a sort of a waif and an orphan. I left the army. I found digs in Pretoria. A cousin of mine helped me out with curtains, a friend of mine that I met at night school, and I set up accommodation, and I started night school doing a BA in languages. I did one year full-time at the university after my parents had returned from the United States. I did a BA at the Pretoria University, largely part-time, and then I did an LLB, a requisite requirement for legal practice as an advocate by night school, by Correspondence College through the University of South Africa. I had in the meantime married, and by the time I got my LLB degree, I was the father of one child, my name. Right. And can I ask, in those days when you did a BA and an LLB, were you required to have a first degree in South Africa before you read law? You were required to have at least two degrees to practice at the bar. To practice as an attorney at the side bar, as we called it, you didn't need it. You needed certain practical qualifications and professional exams. But for the bar, you needed both those degrees or an equivalent from abroad that was recognized. Would I be right in saying that as far as as you were concerned, there was never a doubt that the bar was the route you wanted to follow? Oh, certainly. From the the second day in the army, I I started aiming, how could I get out best? Do I stay in and get a degree at government expense and then bail out? Or do I bail out beforehand? Things decided for me. I failed the first year in, in the military BSc degree with flying colors. I think I got six out of 300 for applied mathematics, which somehow showed that they didn't want me. Anyway, I decided that law is where I was going. I started the studies at Pretoria University to qualify me to do law. You had to do two degrees, but you could do a BA LLB, which was a five-year course, and part of your BA subjects would be law subjects already couldn't do that. I did a full BA that took me four years and an LLB that took me three years. I qualified at the end of, of 58. So that would be, that would bring you into your sort of mid to towards the late 20s when you, when you were approaching a career at the bar? Yes. I had in the worked as a judge's clerk, a judge's private secretary from 1950 to one to 1957. I had been a judge's clerk. I had become fully familiar with high court practice, not only with practice, but with the ethics and the the gossip, the unwritten rules. I knew most of the advocates at the Johannesburg and Pretoria bars. I certainly knew all of the judges in the then Transvaal High Court. And is, does that make the process of, of joining the bar after that easier? Very much so. It eased my course. What was common in, in my day was that you would, having qualified at university or while qualifying in your law degree at night, you would do articles with attorneys. You would be a full-time employee of a firm of attorneys, and then you got eased into the profession that way. You would then qualify as an attorney, make your name with some people around town, and then apply to join the bar. Those days there was a quarantine period of six months, but then you would go to the bar. I never worked as an attorney. I never worked in an attorney's office, and it was a disqualification. It was a handicap. When I started, I knew nothing. I didn't know what a brief cover looked like. I'd never seen a brief cover. I had to be told, this is where you write this and this is where you write that. And you can't just initial a brief cover until you're a suit, 
a silk can just initial a brief cover a stuff guardsman has to write his name sign his name in full when you when you return it so so a silk just puts his initials on it is that the, dif- the distinction a silk can only put his put his initials yes and where did that tradition come from oh, from the brits of course yeah absolutely so let's let's let me ask you about your thought process at the time as a young as a young man doing law thinking about a career at the bar what was it at that point in time in your career about advocacy that attracted you to the bar you know i had when i was in the the year that i was full time at university i had got involved in politics i had with some fellow nutters tried to form a young communist league just to show how revolutionary we were and how against the current we were in my language that's a favorite expression stroop of me against the current i was involved in a political study group an activist group in pretoria and i wanted to be involved in law in the political turmoil that at that stage was starting to develop in south africa the anc and the pac were not yet unbanned there was no violence in the country yet there was political protest there were certainly major political trials starting and i wanted to be part of that i wanted to get involved in that that's why i went to johannesburg in the first place although i studied in pretoria i did not want to to join the bar in pretoria which i regarded as stuffy and nationalist and not my scene i wanted to go to johannesburg where it was at so let's explore what your scene your scene was apart from your early communist sympathies south african politics at that time describe that to us what was the nationalist movement like and, and wh- how did your political thinking evolve as a young man gopal i was not a communist <laughs> this was a, a student prank at the time to show how obvious we were what mavericks we were i started off with enough africana circles throughout the decades of the 20th century there were two main currents one was nationalist the other one was collaborationist i grew up in the latter type of family where we believed that let bygones be bygones don't let the boer war and the bitterness that the concentration camps engendered poison the future let's try to find one another in a unitary state at all times however nobody ever contemplated anything other than whites running the country that had been a given and, and incidentally not because we were nutty and mad that happens to be in the pre-war era before the colonial empires were dismantled the white man's burden was was still very much the culture that prevailed in britain and in the netherlands which were our two main sources of culture in south africa the war changed that for europe it changed it for the rest of the world it didn't change it for south africa until 1994 there was a white hegemony a neo colonialism of a kind in which there was a perfectly good democratic system working for whites and a colonial government running the african population and other people of color that's the way it was i questioned that i questioned that because i came from this collaborationist cooperationist background and we for instance caused a furore in pretoria in the 50s pretoria at that stage was the the hotbed of conservative africanism we held a public meeting in a hall in downtown pretoria to which we invited the president of the Ashton African National Congress chief albert mutuli also a nobel peace prize laureate in his day we invited him to address a group of europeans this was startling and in fact the meeting was broken up by a gang of white thugs who would not let a black address white people in pretoria so that's where i came from that's the kind of background that i had when i got to the johannesburg bar however 
I was seen as an Afrikaner. And Afrikaners are conservative, they're racist, and they are anti-black. Can I just stop you there for just one second, Judge, and just and just ask you about this the the the, the makeup of that bar when you joined it in in fifty eight? Was it you had Afrikaners and then English people who were who were part of the bar, and were there black people who were part of the bar? Gopal, the Pretoria bar was about eighty percent Afrikaner and about fifteen percent English speaking and five percent Jewish. The Johannes bar, when I joined, we had 180 members. Of those 180 members, over 100 were Jewish. Some 65 were English-speaking South Africans, and the rest were about 15 Afrikaners. Some of them politicians who were part-time barristers, but it was very largely an English-speaking liberal institution a significant number of communists or former communists, the Communist Party having been banned in South Africa in the late 1950, but they were known to be communists, although they were no longer ticket-bearing members. But the, it was not kind of institution. So just to clarify, there were no members of colour at the bar at that time? When I joined, there were two members of colour full-time at the bar. Ishmael Mohammed, who made an enormous contribution to our jurisprudence in later life, and one young black advocate who was an ANC activist and who left the country and played no significant role. However, shortly after I had joined the bar, there were three young black Africans who also joined, who had extreme difficulty because in terms of segregationist policy, government policy, they were not allowed to have chambers that couldn't work a white area. When I started, the bar was in one building. If you wanted to join the Society of Advocates, you had to be a tenant of that building. If you were a master, they would subsidize your rent, but you had to be white. So what we did, in the, for instance, in the case of Ishmael Mohammed, a white member, shared chambers with him. The name, the office was in the name of a the white member, and the, the non-white member was often the de facto occupant, but not the nominal occupant. Yeah, just to follow on from what Razlan said, though, I mean, for those two advocates of colour who were part of, of the jo Joba Bar, were they treated differently when they appeared in court by by judges? Oh, uh, certainly they in, in the. In the High Court, can I step back a moment and just give a, a little bit of context? We, as I believe you, have a, a two-level, two-tier judiciary. A High Court, or Superior Courts as we call them, and the Lower Courts, the Magistrates' Courts. Magistrates' Courts in those days were staffed by civil servants, the presiding officers, were overwhelmingly former prosecutors, uh, some policemen, and the lower courts were very conservative and pro-government. The high courts were virtually exclusively staffed, and you could say man because there were no women on the bench in those days, by members of the bar. The bench was picked by the government, by the Minister of Justice, from the ranks of senior counsel at the local bar. There were nine individual bars in the country, each located at the seat of a high court and served as a pool from which the, the judiciary was drawn. The high court judiciary, having come from the profession, was very, very much less racially or politically influenced than the magistracy. The magistracy, I found a very, very uncomfortable audience at times in political cases. In the 60s still, the High Court was not that politicized. By the 70s and certainly by the 80s, even the High Court had become largely politicized and largely pro-government. 
But in those days when I started, it was not the tradition. Thus, for instance, the judge that presided at the Ravonia trial at which Mandela had, and the others were sent to prison for life was not a government supporter. He had never been a government supporter. His father, indeed, was one of the founders of the other party, of the United Party, and had been a, an acting governor general at one stage under the Smuts unionist regime. So the political climate was split as most of South Africa was split. The bar, however, was a very much outspoken, the Johannesburg bar, very much outspoken liberal bar, and at times was in confrontation with the government and issued press statements and had the kind of demonstration where, for instance, they refused for several months to appear before a particular judge who had been appointed from the ranks of the civil service and was seen to be a lackey of the government. In as much as their bread and butter eventually depended upon their appearing in court, the protest faded, but it was made. We can take from that that the advocates of colour were treated no differently than any, any others in the High Court, perhaps differently in the Magistrates Court, but not in the High Court. Let's, let's come now to, to focus a little bit on your early career. And I think with all advocates, uh, when they start off as young advocates, having the right teachers around you is important. Who were your major influences when you were beginning your practice? I had very strong influences even before I went into practice. Having been a judge's clerk, having studied law at night and being in court during the day, I could watch the great members of the Johannesburg Bar, the, the legendary advocates of the era in practice. I had seen the greats in practice. I was inspired by them. I also had, as my judge for whom I worked for several years, a maverick judge who had been a very much a nationalist activist. We got on well notwithstanding. And he gave me a good deal of training. He would say to me, before we went into court in the morning, Johan, now watch what Morris Franks is going to try to do today. He is going to try to break down those big stones into little stones which could be used to hurl at the accused. Watch how he goes about it. And Joe Rudolph, my, my judge at the time, used to give me that kind of hint in the years while I worked for him. And did you, did you observe and, and, and take notes of these greats and what they did right and what they did wrong? I did not make written notes, but I most certainly made uh, mental notes and once I got to the bar, you know, we had in those days a system of pro deo work where the junior bar would defend every undefended accused in a capital case. It was quite amusing that you would meet people, lay people, a maiden aunt somewhere who would say, oh, you've been an advocate for two years now. One day when you... When you really experience, you can do murder cases, whereas that's all I had been doing for the last six years. What murder cases in South Africa was this? What was the, the maximum punishment? Was it death? Was it a death penalty regime? Certainly the maximum punishment was death. And did you feel, I mean, I mean you were a young advocate and you were, in, you were doing death penalty cases. The challenge there must be quite, must be quite great, isn't it, for, for a young a barrister? I would like to say that there was great drama to it and great tension, but de facto, I can't tell you how many capital cases I defended. It, it must be 50, if not more. I had one death sentence in all of those years against a client of mine who was a thoroughly bad man and thoroughly deserved. Murder was any case in which the accused had killed somebody in those days that large numbers of young black men working on the mines, living in compounds in very, very unsavory conditions and with limited access to either women or alcohol, the combination of the often led to violence. And those were the kinds of cases, those would be stabbing cases and those would normally be sentenced 
three years, four years perhaps. If it was a particularly brutal attack, it would be six or seven years. A nominally murder, de facto homicide, three or four. So, so uh, uh, there's, this, there's this famous line from Rumpel where he says, he asks himself, how does one do a, a death penalty case? Is it any different from doing a normal case? And he, he said, nope, you just do it the same way. Is that how you approach them as well? Exactly, exactly. I may also say that in those days, we used to have preparatory examinations. No high court case would come before court without a, pr a prior hearing in the magistrate's court. You would have a record and you could judge from the record how serious this case is and you would not give a real capital case to a young person. Uh, the bar provided defence geared to the severity of the case. Within a couple of days, I was the secretary of the bar and I would do that allocation. And I would say, Oop, this is an ugly case. I must have a guy here of at least 10 years standing, that sort of thing. Right. Life as a, as a, as a young barrister now in, in Joburg, you've started off at the bar. What was life like? Where did you do cases? Were they all in Joburg? Or? No, no. First of all, I had to share chambers when I started. I couldn't afford chambers on my own, and there weren't offices available in the Advocates Building anyway. Subsequently, when I got my own office, it was on one stage rubbished, trashed by people who came and wrote things on the ceiling about Nazis and Afrikaners and such like. Okay. Practice, practice was overwhelmingly in the magistrate's court, apart from pro deo cases in the High Court, and occasional unopposed applications in the High Court, easy money in the commercial court and in the divorce court. But my judge, Judge Ludolf, had said to me that I should try to get into trial court as often as I could, even though it was not necessarily the most lucrative, because the one skill that you can offer as an advocate which the attorneys cannot offer is forensic expertise. Learn to know your way around court, to understand court, to smell a court, to hear a court, to see a court, to feel a witness, to understand a magistrate, to know what a policeman looks like even though he's in civis. So get around. So I did in one year after I had really got going in the early 60s, I did 25,000 miles by motor car in one year to all of the town within 200 miles of Johannesburg. In one court on the eastern border of the country on Monday morning, and I would be on, in another town near the western border on Tuesday and at the northern border on Thursday. All magistrates court trial work, civil cases, civil cases, and criminal cases. And then after two or three years, I started getting a high court trial work, largely at the beginning, running down cases, motor accidents, personal injury cases. I did a lot of that. I also then got into more interesting civil work in defamation work, libel law. I developed quite a, a reputation in that. But I never specialized. I never specialized in a branch of law. I specialized in high court forensic skill as a trial lawyer. So I did civil and criminal work of a heavy kind uh, for most of my career. Let me just take that one step further about these, you use the words forensic skills. Let's see if I can try to get some sort of granular breakdown as to what you think those skills are. On the one hand, of course, as you've said, it's a sort of the unwritten things that you need to be able to do, the smell of the court, to, to know what a police officer is going to do, the judges, that sort of thing. But in terms of approaching a witness, I mean, clearly your, the bulk of your work was trial work. In terms of cross-examining a witness, could you speak to a little bit about how you prepared those cases and what that, those forensic skills were in a, in a very sort of granular form? There's no secret to it. Good cross-examination, I believe, is a product of hard work. It is understanding precisely what the case is about, understanding precisely what the issues are, what the strong points are, 
what the weak points are and what a particular witness can contribute in that context. Then knowing what is the potential, working out how with this particular witness, with this particular kind of evidence, you will go about it. Never ever is cross-examination one size fits all. You've got to gear the cross-examination to the particular witness. The way you cross-examine a policeman, the way you cross-examine an expert, the way you cross-examine an elderly lady are manifestly different. The way you cross-examine a fond, favorable old lady and the way you cross-examine an antagonistic old lady are obviously different. It's thought, it's planning, it's thinking of the detail, not only of the, the obvious issues matters, but the personality of the person and the place that person's evidence will take in the brick wall that you're trying to build, where it will fit in. And then crucially, 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 all of what I've said is very, very interesting, but it, it will get you absolutely nowhere unless you have all of your nerve ends awake in court. You have your notes, yes. You have your notes in large block letters so that you can see them from standing up and not losing eye contact with the court or with the witness. You can see your notes and they are not in detail. They are, what is the point I'm looking for and how in principle I will get, a, get to it. Right. And don't you think in sort of listening as well plays a, a key role in that process? Exactly. So that you talk from your notes, but not to your notes. You talk from your notes to the witness. You realize at all times the theater that you are involved in. You're theoretically talking to the witness, but in fact, it's a dialogue between the two of you. And the more you can get the, the witness to concentrate on you instead of talking to the judge, but looking at you and talking to you, the better, because then you, then you have control. The basic idea still is, in my language, we have a, an expression that you must first try the honey before you try the rod. You get it to your objective by making a friend of the witness Cross-examination is not examining crossly. It is trying to get at your objective by the most peaceable means possible. And of course, always keep your cool, always keep as polite. And the ruder the witness gets, the politer you get. And the contrast in the eyes and ears of the judicial officer are obvious. That's where you need to make the impression. To follow up on that, you are not then one of these advocates that actually have pre-prepared questions before coming into court. No, I would not have pre-prepared questions. The words were worked out. No, you can't. I don't believe that you can do that. You know what the point is that you want to get at. And you will, as you are approaching it, realize that you've got to do it bit by bit, step by step. It's only once you have got the four or five components of the final answer that you can then say, well, then, Mr. Smith, if I understand you correctly, A, B, C, D, and E. <laughs> yeah, that's right. But it must only come from what you have already established. And you will be ticking off as you go the points that you have made. Great. I was just going to say that I think the danger with, with having pre-prepared questions is that you tend to be a slave to them. And it just doesn't allow you the flexibility you need when you are cross-examining someone. Exactly. I always have as, a, as a, an anecdote with the, with, of a, a young colleague of mine who had been a, a judge's clerk with me, who was appearing in a criminal case before a particularly irascible judge. And Bill had worked his questions out one by one, one by one, and he would ask the witness questions one and two, and then the judge would ask question seven, and then Bill would ask question three, 
a Christian four, a Christian five, of which days the judge is lost the judge entirely. And of course, I'm glad you raised the point, Russell. The good point in a case is always the point made by the bench. The good question, the key question is the question asked by the bench. Sidney Kentridge was a past master in doing this. I think you know of Sidney Kentridge. I'm glad you mentioned that name because that's exactly what I wanted to come to next. Before we start dealing with your your life as a silk and and some of the political cases that you did, but South Africa has has sent at least as far as I know two giants to the UK bar. One was Sidney Kentridge, and the other was of course Leonard Hoffman. Where does this rich tradition of exporting your 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 biggest brains come from? <laughs> I beg your pardon. The biggest brains. <laughs> Present company excluded. Present company excluded, of course. (laughs) (laughs) Can I tell you a nasty story? When one particular member of the Johannesburg Bar emigrated to Australia, I remarked that in one fell swoop, he increased the average intelligence of Australia (laughs) and South Africa. Well, doing that with Australia is not very difficult. So, but yes, yeah, so t- tell me, tell us a little bit about, about Sidney Kentridge and, and Leonard Hoffman and this tradition and Stein and this tradition of, of uh, South African legal luminaries going over the seas and working there. I'll deal with it. Just let me make this point that Sydney would ask the questions around the $64 question until the judge getting impatient or thinking that Kentridge isn't really seeing the point, the court would then ask the witness the vital $64 question. Kentridge would say, I'm grateful to your lordship about that. Yes, indeed, of course, sorry. Sydney came in a tradition. The Johannesburg Bar, for a number of reasons, was a most unusual collection of, of weirdos and very bright weirdos. The law in my country, as I think in some other countries, has been largely strengthened, maintained by the Jews. Jewish lawyers are superb. They have been throughout the ages, and they were certainly in Europe. And when the Nazis clamped down in Germany, a number of very bright young legal practitioners left Germany and a number of them joined the Johannesburg Bar. We had an an influx from there. We also had the result of a second generation of very bright young people who were practicing law in Johannesburg, but because they were liberal, because they were English-speaking, and some of them also because they were Jewish, were not candidates for appointment to the bench. So whereas in other jurisdictions, your top silks would be scooped off from time to time to go on the bench, Johannesburg, because it was anti-government, retained most of its true heavyweights. Its battleships remained at the bar. And we had some of the truly great exponents of the advocates' profession when I started. It was an education to see the, the Franks and the Maisels and Sydney learnt from them as I did, as Arthur Chesterton did. Sydney, like I was, was not a, a specialist in any particular branch of the law. Sydney, you would get into your case if you were in trouble, whether it were a criminal case or a civil case. Sydney's performance in the notable political cases, made his international reputation. Sydney did not make his reputation at the Johannesburg Bar and in the legal profession because of those cases. Sydney made his reputation as a general, all-round, brilliant court practitioner and a very good lawyer. And he got, of course, he got those briefs, the big main briefs, because he was had established his reputation in general practice. We had 
at the Johannesburg Bar, certainly as good a collection of senior advocates as you could find in any jurisdiction. And I'm not saying this as, as a wall-eyed patriot. I've been in other jurisdictions. I've seen other court work. For instance, if I could say so, a major patent issue relating to Firestone and Goodyear, they decided in the United States to come and fight that battle in the Johannesburg court because they regarded the tribunal that they would find there as the best tribunal they could hope for. When the International Association of Jewish Lawyers, I can't remember the name, wanted to dispute Holocaust denialists to put them on the rack, they chose the Johannesburg Bar to do so because we could do it. They were good. Of course, they were mercenary. They were there for the money they could make out of it. We weren't agents of charity. The fees were good. If you worked hard and you did well, you could make a good, decent living. You could never get rich because in the, the bar, you didn't have partners and you didn't have employees. Every cent you earned, you earned yourself. Yourself, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Let's now turn to your years as a silk. Uh, you took silk, I think, in 1970, uh, 1972. And what I wanted to explore in this next sort of session, the uh, next chapter, so to speak, is is the kind of political work, the, the, the political cases that you did in South, South Africa under apartheid. And if you could start off by telling us what types of cases you, you, you took on that, were, that had the political flavour. I took on largely heavyweight, non-ANC, anti-government work. I would, for instance, I acted for Chief Butelezi, the leader of KwaZulu at the time and later, and to this day still alive, a major force in Zulu politics. I represented him in his interaction with the government. I acted for another homeland, so-called homeland leader, a Bantu stand leader against the government, Lucas Mangope of Botswana. I acted for Bayes Nadir, the major opponent within the church circles, which were very important in Afrikaner politics, a main opponent of, of apartheid in the, the theological field. I acted for him in a major civil case. I acted for him in a number of criminal cases. I acted for him in a, in a commission of inquiry launched by the government in order to stamp out the Christian Institute, which he had formed as an agency to counter government propaganda in theology. I acted for former ministers, former senior government servants who'd fallen out of favor with the government. Uh, Eshel Rudi, uh, who was the creator of the information department that was running their secret propaganda schemes for the government. And when these were discovered, they wanted to repudiate him. They wanted to send him to jail. I acted for him. Minister Mulder was fired from the government and I acted for him against the government. I acted for Breitenbach, the greatest Afrikaans poet who went pro-ANC and tried as a poet to be a revolutionary and turned out to be a much better poet than a revolutionary and ended up in jail. I acted for him. In fact, it's because I acted for him that I act, eventually ended up as a judge. But that's a different story. Do you also, I think, on the flip side of that of that coin, obviously you've told us about these people you've acted for and some of them ANC activists and, and a buyers who was from the theological side. But you also acted for the other side, political spectrum, at the other end of the political spectrum. I understand you acted for Eugene Terblanche. Yes, you did the AWB neo-Nazi case. So tell us a little bit about the political cases that you did on the right and what were they like? What were they like with personalities? Gopal, let me just first say, I pretend to be a modest person. I am tremendously proud of the fact that I am the prime exponent of the cab rank. 
You came to my chambers. You were prepared to pay my fees. I would act for you. I acted for Jean de Blanche on precisely that basis. He had fallen out with the government. The government were uncomfortable. Uh, he was far too far to the right, and they had framed him. They had buried a cache of arms on his farm, and they charged him with terrorism. I'm pleased to say at that stage in the late 70s, if you were an Afrikaner and you were in trouble with the law, you would say, get Krikler. And Ter Blanche came to my door and I said to him, I make no bones about it. He was very well spoken in Afrikaans. In fact, a, a brilliant orator. Since the late Mr. Hitler, one of the best I have heard. He was really a spellbinding orator. Anyway, I said to him at the outset, I will act for you, but I must let you know at the outset, I have nothing but contempt for your principles and your practices. If you prepare to accept that, I will not promote your politics. I will defend you. I am an advocate. I'm not a politician. And he very correctly said that's precisely why I am here. I want to be defended. I don't want to run a political case. And he eventually ended up with an insignificant sentence on the basis that the judge accepted that he had largely been innocent. I did not succeed in having him totally acquitted, but he certainly didn't go to prison, which he would have done for 15 years on the charge as framed. And what was the judicial atmosphere like in, in that period? Corpa, let me say another thing. I was consulted by Lang Hendrik van den Berg, who was the head of the notorious and rightly feared boss Bureau of State Security, the very uglies of the apartheid regime. When he fell out with the government, he also came to my door. And he was a fascinating human being. I'm grateful that I got to know him. I'm grateful that I could see Eugene de Blanche in the flesh. I was just asking about that sort of judicial atmosphere in that time. Um, one would expect it, there would be very pro-government judges on the bench. Was that the case? Certainly, certainly, certainly. I would like to give you an incident. I acted from time to time as a judge. You would be invited to come and do a month or two when there was a shortage. And on one of these occasions, the judge president spoke to me about something I had said in a judgment, and he had said that I am overtly political and that was not acceptable. And I said to him, I had spoken very sharply to counsel about the effect of certain security legislation. And he had said, you can't say those things. And I had said to him, if you keep quiet in the presence of those things, you are also saying a great deal. Is that not so? And he came back the next day and he actually thanked me and said he had never thought that silence could be tacit a sin. Some of my colleagues, let me say this first of all, you never ever heard politics spoken in judges' chambers, certainly not in the common room, which was really the only place where we interacted at all, socially and semi-professionally, certainly not on the bench. There were some of my colleagues that were extremely right-wing, a right of government, not all of them Afrikaans-speaking, incidentally. There were colleagues who were anti-government, as I was. The fact that I was notably anti-government, I had been party and actually been a trustee of the Legal Resources Center from Foundation and the first chair of Lawyers for Human Rights. That was known. Nevertheless, I was invited to act. So I think that tells you something about the, the attitude of the High Court at, at the time. I was an overt anti-government, not an activist, but loyal, and I was invited to act. Some of my colleagues, I would prefer not to mention any names, 
but certainly there were among them bigots, ignoramuses, and some very bright people on government side. Some genuinely dedicated believers in apartheid as a fair system to give everybody an opportunity to develop fully politically and socially and economically within their own sphere. That was the theory which was uttered. I very nearly used the rude word, but it was nonsense. But they believed it. Yeah, yeah. Let me ask you, I mean, on this list of cases that you did, the political ones, is there one that stands out to you as being the most electric one that you were involved with, involved in? Certainly the Breitenbach case was the was. And, and what was it about that case that, that stands out for you? Well, first of all, Breitenbach was a known for some 10 years already as the most notable modern poet in Afrikaans, a remarkable man. He had married a Vietnamese woman and they had not been, because of that, allowed to live together in South Africa because we had legislation barring sex and even sex within marriage across any kind of a color line. I don't think technically there would really have been a problem, but it was a political gesture on Breitenbach's part to say, I will not live in South Africa where my wife is not welcome. And he went and lived in Paris, from which he wrote and published magnificent work in my mother tongue. So he was a big name in Africana circles. He had then also written some very sharp stuff about the then Prime Minister, John Forster. Forster, who was an, an ex-fascist who had been in internment camp during the war for his pro-German attitudes and actions, and he had become Prime Minister, and Breitenbach had been an outspoken lampooner of Forster. Anyway, Breitenbach, and that this is an entirely different tale, won't go into it, Breitenbach got himself into South Africa to come and form an underground white terrorist group called Okela. Sounds frightfully dramatic. It was a harebrained scheme from the beginning. He was actually already sold out in Paris before he got on the plane. The security police had one of their agents as the air hostess on the flight. He happened to bed down with her for a fortnight at at the dirty weekend joint when they got here. Anyway, Breitenbach was then arrested and charged, and he was sentenced to nine years in prison. A very, very publicly notable case, certainly in, in, in Afrikaner circles. And he had then been trapped in prison, plotting, believe it or not, from prison to blow up the Union buildings and the main tunnel in the Western Cape and to lead an armed insurrection. So this case, he was now already serving nine years and he was now either going to go to the gallows or go to the prison for the rest of his natural life. And this case was a tremendously dramatic case. I was brought into it. I came to the conclusion that Breitenbach was our best weapon if we could let him loose to speak to the judge, that would be a, a great deal towards our success. But he was a quivering jelly. He'd been bullied and browbeaten by the security police. And so we set about restoring the personality. And I'm proud that we managed to do that. By the time the case started, Brayton was in a fit state to put in the witness box. And in Due course, one afternoon, he and the presiding judge, who was the judge president of the Transvaal Court at the time, got into a dialogue about the future of Afrikaner and where it was going. The judge having asked him, you are married, you married a foreign woman, and you were living in Paris. Why on God's earth couldn't you leave this country alone? What did you have to come and do here? And there was an electric atmosphere in the court, and dead still, 
and Breitenbach sat, stood dead quiet. It must have been for a minute. And he then started speaking like only he could, saying that he's been asking himself that question. But his Afrikanerdom is like a boil on the back of his neck. It's painful to touch, but he can't keep his hands off it. And along the, that line with that to me is the most dramatic moment I ever had in a court that afternoon. Because I'd come to love the man. We'd consented extensively to build up his, his personality again. That case ended with him getting a fine of 50 rands, which was more than what he would pay for a movie. <laughs> Goodness gracious. Well, well done on that one. Just to return, just for a couple of minutes, if I may, Judge, before we, we, we start speaking about your, your career post-advocacy, about political influence on judges during apartheid. That's the first, first uh, part of the question I want to ask. And the second is, because of the nature of these cases that you did, was there a personal cost for you and your family? So we can deal with the second question first and then move from there. I started at the Johannesburg Bar because I was not prepared to fit in with the herd in Pretoria, with my fellow Afrikaners and my fellow products of Pretoria University and the Dutch Reformed Church and what, whatever that entailed. So I was in, in some ways looking for contention, but I certainly got it. I did not get a single significant brief from an Afrikaans attorney for the first seven or eight years of, of practice. I got none of the help that a junior needs to get going. I got that work I got from Jews and from wasps, but from my own people, nothing. Got no government work. Socially, our social circle was a constrained one. I think that my children were known to be the children of an Afvakender, an Angersdenkender, a Maverick. Mm -hmm. I do believe that at least two of my children would have been the head prefects of their schools. If they had not been my children. I refused to be exorcised. I insisted on going to church. After some 15 years, they made me a parish council member. I insisted on attending all of the parent teachers association meetings at school and eventually ended up as chair of the school board where my children went, notwithstanding the fact that I was this outsider. Socially, we had a very limited circle of friends among Afrikaners. Most of my friends were English speakers who might make the round table and other English-oriented organizations. At the bar, among my colleagues, I was pleased to say I had my best friends who were Jews. At one stage, I was certainly able to carry on a, a conversation, rudimentary, but nevertheless carry on in Yiddish. I had learnt quite a lot of it when I was still at school, because a number of my classmates were of a generation whose grandparents came from the old country. And I would go home with these boys, I was a, a boarder, and we would speak to Boba in Yiddish. So by the time I was at the bar for some 10 years, I could propose a toast at the wedding, for instance, in Yiddish. I learned a great deal. I was a Zionist at one stage, I must say, having once visited Palestine, much later, I changed my mind quite radically. I saw that I apartheid in a different form. But that also is a story for another day. I, I did not hesitate to join with fellow human rights lawyers to form the Legal Resources Center. I was honored that Sydney and Felicia Kentridge Felicia in particular, asked me to join at the time when they and Arthur Chaskelson were putting together the Legal Resources Center, which was a public interest law firm 
based very much on the NAACP in the U.S. and with influence and help from the U.S., Jack Greenberg into ALIA. We formed it in order to find niches, cracks, weak points in the solid edifice of the uh, apartheid legal structure and drilled and inserted sticks and had significant successes in breaking down the, the more oppressive day-to-day -day rulings of the system. And as I was, as I've said, the founding chair of Lawyers for Human Rights, which we formed at the beginning of the 80s when the security situation in South Africa was getting increasingly repressive in the face of increasingly forceful resistance from the liberation movements. And we formed Lawyers for Human Rights to be uh, a vocal opponent of uh, the shift to the right by government. It did not affect my practice. It did not affect my standing in the legal profession. I'd just like to get back to the to the point, your earlier answer to the question Gopal posed on personal costs. The way I get it that is that you were socially ostracized, so to speak, from your own community. But also I get the impression that that didn't matter to you. You went on despite all that. Could I just ask, what is it that you have within you, I suppose, to ignore all that and just say, you know, this is this is the right thing to do. And if the Afrikaners community can't abide by me, I'll just carry on. Raslan, you, you touched me on a, on a raw nerve. I am a failed Christian. I believe in the innate dignity of human beings as creatures of God and that it is sinful to discriminate. It's that simple. I could not go along with the policy that determined the merit of a human being on the basis of ethnicity or color or religion or gender or anything of the kind. I don't go around propounding this. I was not and could never be a communist, but I was quite happy to work with a liberation movement as long as we served that basic human right interest. And that's, that's as, as close as I can get to explain it to you. Uh, sorry, I, I, <laughs> I went into there, but uh, I thought that was just remarkable, you know, the pressure that you were under and all that. And for you to take this, that particular position must have been quite lonely. Yes, but you also get a kind of cussing pleasure out of it. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I can see that, Judge. <laughs> Ultimately, I suppose it's the ego that prevails. Yeah. Can I just now just focus a little bit more on on this on this political influence that 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 the that the judges were under or were not? I'm interested in in during the apartheid period. We've got a system where judges are appointed by the government, and yet I think a little bit of the of the of what I'm getting from you, Judge, is that there wasn't really political influence on these judges when they sat as judges. They may have had views, they may have been right, some of them right wing, some of them left, but would that be correct? And if it is, I find it very unusual for a government, a nationalist sort of government like that, that allows a system where judges can maintain their independence. Gopal, uh, I, I don't claim that my perspective is the ultimate, but I do believe that it is, is a pretty sharp the answer is not one faceted. In the first place, if you have grown up and you live in an environment of repression and prejudice, you don't have to be influenced. If you are a bigot, you are a bigot anywhere and you don't have to be influenced by the government to behave as a bigot. If you are nationalistically inspired, you don't need overt pressure. Thus, for instance, one of the great English-speaking liberal, in quotation marks, Cape judges of appeal could justify apartheid legislation on the basis that it was a social experiment by government without going into the merits or the demerits 
of the system. If you are imbued in your environment, you don't have to be influenced in a particular direction. That's part of it. Another part of it, and an important part of it, is that because the bench was appointed from the ranks of senior counsel, they were either by birth or by degeneration in the profession, egotists. We all are. And you get to the stage as a senior advocate where you take the decisions and you've got to take agonizing decisions and you've got to take them on your feet and you've got to get used to taking these awesome decisions. Awesome in the context of the case only, but but also professionally. Judges who have been raised in that tradition are rugged individualists, and they do not like being told by anybody what they must do and what they must not do. And there's a, a certain professional arrogance, call it pride if you want to be kind, in that I am the judge in this court. The jokes I make are funny. This is my court. It's not the the court. I, the court starts whenever I arrive, not at 10 o'clock, because that's the starting time. I determine when it adjourns. That kind of arrogance also makes for independence of mind. I'm damned if I'm going to take instructions from any politician. I am on the bench, on merit, I'm a judge. I'm close to God, he's just about two steps below me. It certainly does make for independence of mind. Never mind the method of appointment and never mind the security against dismissal. It's people who have been trained professionally to be independent-minded, to make up their own minds, and to tell the world to go to hell if they disagree. We had an incident at the Johannesburg Bar where a political lackey had been appointed. And uh, the very first time he was in Johannesburg, sitting on the bench in a full up motion court, he was throwing his weight around a bit. And an elderly old Jewish practitioner observed, hey, since two weeks he's been on the bench, and already he thinks he's there on merit. It really did work. And I may tell you that in the years that I was on the bench, under apartheid and in the, in the democratic era, nobody ever suggested in any way whatsoever outside court in formal address how I should determine a case. Once, once in a sensitive political case, a colleague came to talk to me and to persuade me to go pro-government. I chased him out of my office. That's really interesting. Let's just pivot now to that to your period on the bench. And I think you were elevated in 1984. And then you joined the Constitutional Court in the democratic era. The question I have to ask of you, I've got two aspects I'd like to ask you about your life as a judge. The first is this. It clearly comes across that you enjoyed your life as an advocate. When you became a judge, what was the one thing that you missed the most about being an advocate? Of course, independence. Independence to take the work that I wanted to do, to decide the cases that I would do, being obliged to do the run of the mill that is delivered to you is, is awkward. Purely professionally, I found it extremely difficult to put up with incompetence in court. I found it an irritation. I was not a good judge because of that. I was impatient. I would be harsh on counsel who wasted time or who, according to my lights, wasted time. I missed the rough and tumble. And above all, I missed running the case. Being the umpire instead of being on court was nowhere near as pleasant. But let me add this, and this is not only my own experience, 
this is an experience of many of my colleagues and friends. Within a couple of months of seeing things from the other side, you start to feel that this is actually where the practice of law is. This is what it's about, and this is what I was born to do. This is what I want to do, and this is what I would prefer to do. So I was awkward at the beginning, but but I soon got over it. Could I ask what brought about the change in the perspective? I can't put my finger on it. All I can tell you is that I started seeing the adjudicatory process more with a bird's eye view, I suppose, more interesting, more exciting, because I was seeing it from the outside and looking at the opposed contentions, being able to take a ringside seat and not to be involved, not to get the dust of the arena in my eyes. I actually enjoyed that. I enjoyed getting better at it and restraining myself and leaving the battle to the combatants, trying to do my best as a referee. Yeah. So sitting up there on the bench, looking down at these advocates who are now appearing before you, what was the most annoying quality that you found in an advocate? I don't have to think at all. No, it's not having done your effing homework. When he counsel says to you, the papers are in order, my lord. I ask for an order in terms of prayers. One, two, three. And you've looked at the file and you know that there are documents missing. And counsel says the papers are in order because the lazy sod hasn't looked at his brief. And he's going to charge a fee for being my assistant, being the officer who was supposed to be able to enable me to do justice. And he hasn't done his work. That's certainly the most, uh, the most, likewise, asking questions, the answer to which is totally irrelevant. And then if you say, it's the so and so, what on earth is the purpose of that question? And he looks at the sky and he says, credibility, you know, Lord, credibility. <laughs> <laughs> Not having done their work. Yeah. Okay, and and just to wrap up this part about your life on the on the high court bench, at least before we this interview, we had a little chat with you, and I think you you said with some degree of pride that as an advocate, you only had I think six reported decisions, because your work, as you as you said, was trial work. It was you know it was forensic. How did you find this shift to scholarship, which clearly is necessary when you became a judge, and did you find it difficult? You know, Gopal, it was not that much of a shift. In order to be able to do proper trial work, obviously you've got to know what the case is, you want to know what the law is. You've got to understand what the case law is in respect of particular issues in the case. So I never claimed to be a jurist, but I certainly was no stranger to research and preparation. I also did a good deal of pellet work while still at the bar, and uh, which was just also forensic work on your feet in court, where you're dealing with a printed record or just merely issues of law. So it wasn't a complete changeover for me. What I did find useful when I got on the bench is to have counsel who can do the research for you. And that's one of the reasons I was I was impatient with those that who had not. If I knew a case that was relevant and counsel didn't quote it to me, I would make a mark against that person's name and never, ever trust him again. So uh, we had an adequate library in Johannesburg in judges' chambers. And in those days, there was no electronic research as yet. The major change as I was on the, in my years on the bench was that in the beginning, you had to go and look for the law. You had to go out as a prospector with your little pick and go and find what you were looking for. Nowadays, and latterly, of course, it was a multitude of overburden to find the ore. You had to get rid of a, a lot of rubbish piled on top of it and with counsel just 
going on the internet and giving you 67 cases, 60 of which were wholly irrelevant. Yeah. The last question now about your, your time as a judge in the, in the apartheid era and relates to a comment that you made to us when we spoke earlier about there being a sort of dual system of justice. I think the phrase you used was justice between whites. Could you just speak to that a little bit more and tell us what that entailed in apartheid South Africa? It was a perfectly straightforward, ordinarily legal system as you would find it, for instance, in Australia or, or Canada, any other white British dominion with the, uh, the British legal tradition and adversary system, the common law system. Our law, our civil law was Roman Dutch law, which is not, not English law. In fact, a very learned profession because you really had to go look for the principles back in Roman law and in the 16th, 17th, 18th century Dutch law. So um, very much less based on precedent. You had to go look and you had to be a capable of reading in Latin, which I was. The law was the usual business, an insurance company, a matrimonial, and, and personal injury cases. And then, of course, the administrative law stuff, licensing, air licensing work. I, I specialized in administrative law, nickel air licenses, general, ordinary, middle class, developed economic. Right, right. And which, which was, as a, as a matter of fact, in Australia and South Africa at that time, between whites, I guess. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, so occasionally there would be a black businessman who would be involved in litigation. But overwhelmingly, and, uh, and of course in KwaZulu Natal, there was a major Indian component in in the We saw little of that in Johannesburg. Yeah. Okay. Let's now turn, Judge, to your career in the democratic era. And of course, we all know that you are on the constitutional court and part of that transitional process and some very, very important decisions that came out there. But I would like to focus, subject to what Razlan may have to ask you on this, I'd like to focus on something you spoke to us about earlier as well, which was your relationship with Mandela. And obviously, that, that it played a part in you sort of going to the Constitutional Court, I'm sure. But tell us a little bit about your relationship with him. How did it begin? And what did you think of him? <laughs> you pressed that button. You must have your finger ready to press the stop button. <laughs> I did not know Mr. Mandela before his release. In fact, I did not know him until the time of the election. I had never met him. I may say that at the time when I was still at the bar, I had tried to persuade the then Minister of Justice, when I had gone to see him about Breitenbach, incidentally, that they were missing the bus, that they must get Mandela out of jail as quickly as possible because he was the last chance of the nationalist government to having a peaceful transition. I had admired him from afar. I had been in court the day he made his famous statement what he had lived for, what, if, if needs be, he was prepared to die for. I admired him a great deal, but he had disappeared in the South African system. You may not publish him, you may not say anything about him. You knew nothing about where he was and what he was doing. Then when he was released, he was this dramatic figure that I had dreamt about and had spoken in favor of. And when I was on the electoral court, uh, in the IEC, I first spoke to him personally. And the very first words I ever had from him were by phone call late at night, when my then wife called me and said, there's a man on the phone who says Man is Mandela, I don't believe it. Well, it must have been about 11 or 11, past 11 at night. And it was Mandela. He always made his own phone calls. Now, I don't know about you and your professional life, but one of the major irritations of mine has been that you get a phone call and it's some telephone birdie who says, will you hold the line for Mr. So-and-so? And you hold the line while they go and look for Mr. So-and-so who's gone to the 
school, gone to get a cup of tea, or maybe go around the broth. Mandela made his own phone calls, and it's the first conversation that I had with him. He phoned to say to me, he knows that things are very difficult at the moment for the Electoral Commission, but he wants me to know that I have his full confidence and his support. That's all he said to me. Not in just those few words, but that's what the message he conveyed to me. I then met him purely formally on, I think, two occasions when I reported to him and Mr. de Klerk during the run-up to the election. And then the first time I met him socially was when after the election, he invited the Electoral Commission to a meal. I think it was a lunch at his residence. That's when I first got to talk to him as a human being. And then he asked me to join the board of the Nelson Mandela Children's Fund as a trustee, and I got to know him very much better there. We worked intermittently over many years together, and Betty and I became very, very fond of him. I may tell you a fascinating story. Uh, I find it fascinating anyway. On his 80th birthday, he was having a function at a major conference center just outside Johannesburg, and we were invited to this. We went to it, and there was a queue of cars, and my government driver, who was a very smart boy, said he would take a shortcut and you'll get in through a different gate. And we got in through a different gate, lo and behold, and he dropped us at the foot of some stairs, and up we walked. We didn't know the place. Well, we'd been there once, but we weren't familiar with it. And we got in, we walked up the steps, no guards, no interview, no search, no nothing. And we walk into a room, and here are Mandela and Mrs. McCall sitting together on a sofa with Michael Jackson hanging over the back of the sofa like a protective angel. And here we were in the inner sanctum of the Holy of Holies. <laughs> so we, uh, I, I kissed Mrs. Michelle, and Betty got kissed by Matima. They announced their wedding that day on his 80th birthday. So this was a great occasion. And we were personally in the inner sanctum. We were then embarrassed. We said to one another, let's get the hell out of here. Us mortals don't belong here. Yeah, how do you improve on that? Gosh. Well done on gate, on gate crashing, Josh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but Judge, can I ask you, just in terms of Mandela, before you want to expand a bit more on your experiences with him, but what was the chemistry like between him and the clerk? Did you manage to observe that? I did not see them with one another personally. You, you know what public perception is, that it was, you, you have, you, I have not, nothing to add to that. I saw them in a purely formal context where I may say, although de Klerk was the president of the country, Mandela was certainly as important figure in the configuration of the meeting. But uh, the interaction I can't tell you about. Okay. Right. Now, we, we come now to what we call the quick fire section, which is uh, under the general areas. Um, and quick fire because... Can I ask a point about Madiba, about Mandela? Please do. Please do, Judge. He spoke to me in Afrikaans at all times. He thought that that would be the dignified, correct, polite thing to do. The more I tried to speak to him in English, the more he spoke to me in Afrikaans, in which he was very proficient, but not as articulate as in English. In English. Amazing. So we come now to these to the quick fire questions. The first of which is, which part of your practice as an advocate did you enjoy the most? Was it the intellectual exercise or was it the sort of interpersonal skills? Interpersonal, no doubt. Interpersonal. Okay. Second, the opponent that you respected the most? Izzy Maisels. Tell us a little bit about him. He was a, the giant of the Johannesburg Bar. I was in one case against him, and it was intimidating in the extreme. 
I didn't I ever have to deal with him again, except as his junior on a number of occasions. Right. Okay, next one. The judge who challenged you the most. I would think a man, let me, what was his name? Bill Trollop, who was a judge on the Transvaal Court and then on the Appellate Court, who was a judge who engaged with you in a style that I developed for myself later, is asking adverse questions to test your own perception, to be a devil's advocate in asking questions of counsel. And Will Trollop did that to me, and I found it, until I tumbled to what he was doing, very, very difficult to deal with. Otherwise, particularly one chief justice was a very domineering, tough man. I found him difficult to appear before, in, not intimidating, but put you off your stride, made it difficult to do your best. Okay. Then what would you identify as being the most important quality that an advocate should have? Gopal, it's very easy to be trite and so integrity. Of course, integrity, honesty with yourself, honesty with your client, honesty with your profession, honesty with the job that you are going to do, honesty with the judge that you've got to deal with. I think unshakable integrity. Okay, brilliant. Okay, that's all I, I actually have. Raz, is there anything else that you, you would like to add? One final question to you, Judge. You said as a judge, you also developed this style in which you like to pose questions to counsel. Is that because, because you, and you said it could be a way of testing the counsel's knowledge, but as a judge, you have a, a brief, particularly as an appellate judge, do you really make up your mind because you read the file beforehand, the brief beforehand, and you're pretty sure which way you want to rule? Or do you go inside the arena there as a judge and, you know, you're re still relatively open to persuasion? Russell, I, I, like a politician, I would like to say I'm glad you asked the question, and I really do mean it. Appellate adjudication is an entirely different ballgame. Appellate jurisdiction is, is, is more difficult. You've got to deal with colleagues uh, sitting on the bench with you whose view you may not have share, uh, certainly in the, in the appeal court where I sat and in the constitutional court, you go into court having not a clue what your, what your colleagues think of the case. You haven't discussed it at all. It's unsettling in that respect, but it is also unsettling in that you have read the papers. You have read not only the papers, but you've read the heads of argument and you have formed some kind of a view, and you have got to try to say to yourself, keep an open mind. What I did was I would not read the heads of argument until I had studied the record myself. It meant that the case is much longer. You don't actually know what the issues are. They haven't been digested or pre-digested for you. You've got to do the case you see the notice of appeal and you see the record. I found that that way I could keep an open mind better. You go into court, you certainly, if a judge tells you he goes into court without any preformed conceptions, just don't believe him. You can't go into court not having some prima facie view. And there are two schools of thought. You go into court and you put your proposition your difficulty, your point of view to counsel at some stage or another, or you don't. You wait for counsel to deal with it, and if they don't, you hit them on the back of the head without them knowing that. I believe that the course of justice required you to put your difficulties, to put your prima facie views to counsel, not necessarily at the beginning, uh, at some appropriate stage. But once you're in a collegial court that I, like I was in the constitutional court, the ball game gets entirely different because your colleagues may ask the questions. They may ask, that puts the debate in an entirely different direction. The thread goes elsewhere and you, you've, you've got to go and work it out for yourself afterwards. So working with, with 10 colleagues as I had to in court 
was a different game again. But we did go in with some conceptions, some difficulties. You could, for instance, very easily in a, in a, in a, in a simple court case where there are only two judges, you could say to the appellant, I don't have to hear you. As at this stage, I am in your favor. Let's hear what the respondent says. Who may change your mind for you? It happens. Thank you for listening to that episode of Advocates, the podcast. Before you go, if you do enjoy the work that we do, we need to ask you a small favor. Could you please go to the podcast platform that you use and rate us? And please leave a review on our social media channels. Thank you and see you next episode. Listen to the voices of the advocate.